if you want to see the benefits from CBIA, they are all around you. Yes. In fact, we are sitting in one of them yes, right exactly now. Right. That's a very good observation. <laughs> yeah. The Global Passport Investor is your go-to podcast. All right, well, welcome once again to the Global Passport Investor. I'm your host, Eric Major, an investment migration veteran with over three decades in the game. We continue our world tour of citizenship and residency by investment and all things investment migration. Watching this on YouTube, well, please leave your questions in the comment section. And if you're listening to the podcast, we invite you to email us at questions at globalpassportinvestor.com. Today, we are discussing St. Kitts and Nevis Citizenship by Investment, the oldest modern day economic citizenship program in the marketplace. And so before we meet our very special guests, let me tell you where we are recording today. I'm in the aptly named Banana Bay in the five-star hotel, the Park Hyatt to be precise. This is in Christoph Harbor, and this hotel is a 4.6 rating. In fact, Nigel Tisdall, the destination expert for the acclaimed Telegraph Travel, uh, has described this as the most luxurious place to stay on St. Kitts and the very first resort in the Caribbean from the Park Hyatt brand. He continues to say that there's an elegant portico that reflects uh, lovely pool waves and the sprawling of lawns and palm trees throughout a generously sized pool edged with buildings that are referenced of the heritage of St. Kitts through stone arches and a replica sugar mill that they use for yoga. All right, well, this is simply to give you an idea of the, uh, the stylish uh, elements of this part of the Caribbean. Uh, so now let's explain a little bit about the topic of today. Citizenship by investment for those of you who are listeners for the first time or even to recap for those who are returning. Uh, in essence, economic citizenship in St. Kitts, uh, in Nevis, well, you need to make first and foremost a qualifying investment into the country or alternatively, uh, alternatively a con contribution to the economy. And exactly what this entails is something that we'll uncover with our guests now. So without further ado, let's welcome Mr. Michael Martin, the, the head of St. Kitts and Nevis Citizenship by Investment Unit. Thank welcome. you very much, Eric. And our dear friend, fellow uh, Farron Lawrence of Lawrence & Associates. And he's also a local entrepreneur. So welcome to you both, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you for you. coming. Thanks Thank for having me. Here. All right, well, listen, Michael, let me start with you, uh, because I did some math and some research. We touched on it. We all know St. Kitts was first uh, at the helm with this uh, idea of citizenship by investment, and it turns out it was 40 years ago, uh, 1984, by my last accounts. Do you know how this idea came about? Do you know a little bit of the genesis of this? Well, let me tell you, Eric, 40 years ago, I was nowhere near this <laughs> industry. <laughs> I was in the insurance business, yes. and okay. at that time, I was posted in Anguilla, ah. where I had started a branch for the insurance company that's affiliated with National Bank Group. Yes. Now, as you know, we are a small island developing mm. state. Mm. We don't have any natural resources. Well, none has been discovered yet. Mm -hmm. We have not discovered any oil, any gold, any silver, diamonds, any copper, copper yeah. diamonds, mm. and all of those things. Mm. And so, my belief is that at that time, the administration of the day thought that this was a novel, innovative way of attracting foreign investment. And so I believe that that was the driving force that led to the creation of what we now know as the investment migration industry, because mm -hmm. it was created right here. Right here, through your provisions. And so I think that was the, the main reason behind it, yeah. to attract foreign investment. Yeah. Of course, it started off slowly. You know, it was a new idea. Mm -hmm and has developed over the years, has totally evolved into what it is today. Yeah, no less a billion dollar plus industry. Yeah. Uh, and through an expertise that was developed right here, absolutely right. 
Uh, now, Farron, over to you. As you know, uh, our company, Latitude, uh, works very closely with yours here on the island at Lawrence's Associate. You help ultimately investors become kitticians to become citizens of St. Kitts and Nevis. Uh, can you explain to our listeners uh, what are the requirements to successfully become a citizen under this program? Well, um, first of all, again, thanks for having me yeah. here. It's a pleasure. Great to have you. Um, the, the requirements of the program has evolved quite a bit over the years, as you would imagine. But today, where we are, I, will just, I wouldn't give you details per se, but there are five key areas, uh, five key requirements that persons interested should be aware of. Mm -hmm. One has to do with criminal record. Mm -hmm. the, the person must not have had a criminal record of any sort or of any kind. Two, that person should not pose any security risk to, to the country or to anywhere for that matter of fact. Mm -hmm. You know, should not be involved in any kind of terrorist financing and those kind of activities that could be of risk to a, a particular country. Um, they have to show, thirdly, they have to show they have the financial resources mm -hmm. to make the necessary investment. There, there are basically three pathways. One, we have a sustainable island state fund with, that you pay into. It's like a contribution of a, roughly about $250,000. Or we have what we call the public benefit, the public good option, mm -hmm. where you can buy into something that the government has determined to be an investment that's in the interest of the people mm -hmm. and, and government of St. Kitts and Nevis. That's also $250,000. And then you have the investment option mm -hmm. where to help generate economic activity and build hotel rooms and, you know, you can, you can invest in that kind of, of, of pro project mm -hmm. and qualify for citizenship. And the requirement there is 400,000. So th again, thirdly, it's to show the financial uh, resources are there. Fourth, the applicant must not have ever been denied a visa from any country that St. Kitts and Nevis um, has visa-free access um, arrangement with, yes. per se. So had you been turned down for a, a visa from England or, or the EU, places, again, where we have visa-free access, right. um, you cannot qualify. And lastly, the fifth is one that is very important, just as important as all the others, is the whole issue of accurate and full information mm -hmm. in the application. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot overstress that. Um, the information you provide must be accurate and you must not say, well, you didn't ask or I didn't tell. That's, yes. not, that's not a response. Um, I often say to clients, I'd rather you give me the negative information with an explanation mm -hmm. so that we can report that directly to the CIU. And see if it's surmountable or addressable. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so I like point. to emphasize that one. I've seen too many um, potential citizens not have an opportunity to become a citizen because they left out something on the application mm -hmm. or something they indicated was not quite so. And it's, it, it's important to know that the due diligence process of the CIU is extremely good. They will find out. So again, those are the five key areas that I think persons who are interested in want to look at. In fair enough, I, I like the, in outlining those five, uh, you didn't start off or emphasize just the investment or contribution. I mean, three or four of those five is a DD consideration. It's about having no criminal issues or backgrounds, not being of disrepute or being a risk to the nation. It's about being open and transparent and sharing the information so the CIU can make proper determination, basically of being good citizens that are applying and that they're not offside with your peer um, states who, who off afford visa-free travel to petition. So, so there's a lot of emphasis on DD. I bring that right back to your world, Michael, because last I checked, that's a big part of your day job is reviewing uh, and assessing citizenship, or that of your team, assessing applications. And, and some would say that these programs are intrusive. Uh, there's quite a bit of information, and it's quite a comprehensive process. Well, what would you say to them about that? What is the most important determinant to ensuring a successful application? And, 
And, and um, why is it so intrusive? Well, you know, as you indicated, the most important aspect of processing these applications is the due diligence, the DD. Very, very important because it helps us to assess the applicant and to determine if the applicant is the right person to be awarded. Yeah, bestowed and awarded. Yes. Bestowed with our citizenship. Yeah. So that is why it appears to be um, intrusive. And it is intrusive. It, it may appear that way because of the factors that Farron mentioned earlier. We have to find out. And in the context of what's happening in the world today, mm -hmm. we have to find out if you are involved in activities that will damage the reputation of the country, mm -hmm. that will be bad for our national security interests, mm -hmm. and for those um, of our international partners. So it is, it is very important. We, we are not operating in a vacuum. In a vacuum, no. It's, it's a we, we are part of the global community. whole world, yes. the global community. Yeah. And so we have to make sure that we do things in a manner that is that does not disrupt the relationships that we have internationally. That's right. So yeah, that's very, is, very important. Yeah. No, and it's, um, yeah, it, you know, people think these programs are, are very transactional at times, but the reality is... Um, if, if one had a nefarious background, this would probably be the last route or the least uh, attractive route one would want to take uh, to get uh, enhanced mobility. In the end, as you, uh, as you both well know, I know we all prosecute and, and mount these applications, have clients, you review and assess them. It is a comprehensive process. It takes and requires um, someone who's serious and is prepared to be open and, and disclose their, their story. I mean, some, some clients and agents get get frustrated over it, but it's, it's necessary. Yeah. We have to do that to ensure that we don't bring into our program, you know, Someone people, disrepute. people who are, you know, of disreputable yeah. character and so mm -hmm. on. So that's very important to us. Well, before, thank you, uh, Michael, for that. And indeed, before we move on to the next uh, question, let me remind uh, YouTuber viewers to leave their questions in the comments section. And for those of you who are listening to the podcast, don't forget to email your questions at uh, questions at globalpassportinvestor.com. The greatest investment you could ever make is an investment in your future. Rift Trust and Latitude Group is the leading provider of residency and citizenship solutions for high net worth individuals. Our clients are like our extended family. We're a global firm with a local focus. What makes us truly unique is our leadership team. 100 years of combined industry experience and we're working every day with governments to improve and build new residency and citizenship programs. Obtaining a second residence or citizenship is the best modern insurance policy for you and your family. Our clients expect the world. We, we deliver. deliver it. Hello, Hello to freedom. Now back to you, Farron. Uh, I want you to go back in time. You, I know you're from this island. You grew up here. How do you compare this lovely island of St. Kitts and Nevis uh, that you grew up in uh, with the, the country that is uh, here before us today. What's, uh, what's evolved? What's changed? How, how would you categorize that? Um, you, have, you have two days for me to... <laughs> two <in>. days. <laughs> it's a long list of things. <laughs> oh, a lot has changed. A lot has changed. Yeah. Uh, did you really? I, I, but I'm going to try to put it in a nutshell for you. Please, um, yeah. First of all, uh, during the time I, I, as a youngster, um, you could practically count the number of persons on the islands who had like a first degree or second degree tertiary, ah. tertiary, ter tertiary education. Yes. Okay. We have seen that um, grown tremendously. Um, mm. For the most part, for the most part, if you're really interested in going up to college, the government or there are programs put in place for you to do so. That's and so important. now we see a high percentage of our population having tertiary education, yeah. masters, and um, so, so that's, that's, very, that's one of the big change. Um, infrastructure. Mm. 
Uh, I grew up in a time when, before I go to school at mornings, I had to head about maybe 10 buckets of water on my head to fill up a drum that my family would use for the day. And oh, that right. was every morning. Um, so the, well, the water pipes were dry. Uh, we have seen where development now, where we have catchments and water is mm -hmm. practically in every pipe around the, the island. Um, electricity, you would- You know, if I could say in the same vein of infrastructure, and I, as you know, travel this region uh, quite extensively, your, your roads here are miles uh, beyond uh, of your peers. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, it, I don't know if people know that. I, I notice it because I drive in all these islands and, and I have a smooth ride coming all the way here and from one end of the island to the next. It's not the case. I won't name them. It's not the case in, in many places. Uh, so what you talk about water, but roads as well, education has is, is, is been obviously key. And it might surprise you, you know, maybe as recent back as the last as 20 years ago, some of those roads were dirt tracks. And so we have seen that development. Um, electricity, mm. um, for us to have the level of constant electricity now, that never existed. Mm. Um, half of the week, you're without power. Some areas of the island, no power. Um, so we have seen a lot of infrastructure, healthcare, um, you know, a lot of simple procedures you needed. You had to try to go overseas. We have seen that being mm. done here. We have seen a lot more doctors, the ratio of doctor to residents is, is has improved Perfect. tremendously. Probably, yes, yes. Lawyers, Law, yeah, lawyers same thing with lawyers. And professionals in general. Um, and, and, you know, we have seen, one of the big things though I have seen, and the one that maybe stick out to me biggest is the, the development and expansion of the middle class in this country. Okay, very um, important. We had, for, mm. for many years, we had the extremely poor and mm. the extremely high. In the last 20 years, we have seen a, a, a blow up of, of our middle class, which has done well for our country. And lastly, I would just point to the fact that Sink is now becoming the sub region melting pot where you have mm. persons are now coming from other islands to, 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 to seek work mm. and, and to advance themselves and to send remittances back to their families, similar to what we did many yeah. years ago when we go to the USA or the Virgin Islands. And so, this cross-pollination right, is really important absolutely. to the development of a nation. I agree with that. Well, that's why immigration in general is so important. Yes. Uh, and, and you pointed to some very important uh, developments over the years. And I have to think, I, I know that CBI isn't the answer to all challenges, economic challenges, but certainly we could point to how this program over the decades have been, has been instrumental. Michael, I saw something in, in June of last year where the government, I think, uh, funded uh, COVID relief from the funds of the Sustainable Growth Fund. I note that there may have been other, um, you know, uh, initiatives or projects that the program has funded. Certainly, a portion of the investments uh, could go towards real estate and touristic developments, which is important in feeding the very important tourism sector that this island uh, has as a, as a core economic uh, activity. But could you give us a, a few examples of some of the good deeds that the, the, the SGF or the, the program in general? CBI is absolutely important um, to this country. And we have seen that from way back when we had the, um, the SIDF, mm -hmm. and uh, then we have had a number of um, options after that, um, the Hurricane Relief Fund, the SGF, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the, the options that we have today. CBI, as I understand it, contributes about one third of the GDP okay. um, so it's not in, in, in this country. Mm -hmm. So I like to say that if you want to see the benefits from CBI, they're yes. all around you. Yes. In fact, we are sitting in one of them yes. right now. <laughs> That's a very good observation. Yeah. <laughs> this, this didn't exist. Uh, yeah, this would not exist yeah. without CBI. Right here. This is a direct um, yeah. result and what a of, C of CBI. Of a tourism, uh, the Park Hyatt. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's, um, it's in the, the roads that you drive on. The, the, the schools, the infrastructure that Farron has just um, described. 
So the benefits of CBI, we, there, there is no doubt about them. Mm. They're, they're right here for they're right before for us very to see. Nice. Well, listen, I, I started earlier mentioning how uh, the CBI has been around for 40 years. Um, but we were also speaking before the podcast how um, there are some geopolitical headwinds and challenges, uh, f- f- largely, I would say, for lack of understanding what these programs are about and, and what these clients uh, are really all about. Uh, like in any business, there's uh, uh, maybe a, a few nefarious few that try to slip through the cracks, but for the most part, this is a business that have its worthy applicants who are looking to avail themselves of a privilege for all the right reasons, right? You, uh, the three of us know this, um, but let's talk about these headwinds. I know there's going to be some meetings uh, in the year ahead, if not uh, later uh, next month. Uh, Without getting into details, is this uh, something that you think will shorten the shelf life of this offering or of the, of the CBI? Are we going to see this still around in 10 months or in 10 years or even 10 decades? What's your view? Well, the way I would look at it is that the geopolitical headwinds, as we refer to them, they're not going to go away because um, each country has its own national interests. Mm-hmm that they um, want to pay attention to. We understand that. And I believe they are also beginning to understand that CBI is very important to us. Mm -hmm. And it is also in their interest to continue to support CBI. Mm -hmm. But we live in a rapidly evolving geopolitical environment. Um, There are conflicts in Ukraine, in the Middle East, Mm -hmm. and and those conflicts result in... Well, complicated dynamics. Yeah? You know, consequences such as, you know, migration and so on and that Mm -hmm. sort of thing that are of concern to our international partners. Mm. Our approach to this, these international headwinds has been to engage mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. our international partners. Mm-hmm. We do not necessarily see them as the enemy because we understand their concerns. And some of their concerns are also our concerns. Mm-hmm. You know, their security concerns are also our concerns. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They don't want terrorists and financiers of terrorism hmm. in their country. We don't want them either. Guess what? You don't want them either, yeah. So, yes. you know, so there's, there's a mutual interest in addressing these concerns. And we have taken the, the view that it is better to engage, yes. you know, rather than to... Avoid. Avoid or to, you know, fight a battle that you cannot win. Yes, yes. And that is what we have been doing. So we have we engage with the Americans, we engage with the EU, we engage regularly with the UK mm-hmm. Home Office, and that's our approach to it. And, and fair, I mean, you're a service provider, uh, so you're not in directly in the government realm like Michael is. But what, what's your take on this? Is is this? I mean, it's not without its pain points uh, in so far as, you know, the ebbing and flowing of, of the demand and the adjustments the country has made here with the CBI will have an impact, has had an impact. What's your take on St. Kitts's position I, well, as a practitioner? As a, as a practitioner, um, first of all, I think you, you asked if it's going to be here for 10 weeks, 10 months, 10 years. I think it's going to be 10 years and more, okay. simply because global migration from time immemorial has been going on and it's not going to stop. That's true. What's going to change is the environment mm-hmm. and the way it is done, as we have seen over the, the, the last few years. So, and, and as these challenges we talk about come, comes up, where you have criminal minds coming up with new criminal methods, you, 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 you ha- we have to adapt. Yeah. But I do believe that programs like the CBI programs, the Citizenship by Investment programs, are going to continue. There's a life for them. It's just for the the, the, the players, the, the, the agents, the service providers, 
to keep changing with the, with, with the environment as it changes. Mm -hmm. um, that's my view on it. Yeah. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I, where I sit in my office, I am pleased to see some of the work that this government, the St. Kitts Navy's government, is doing toward adapting to those new challenges, those new changes, th that new environment. Mm -hmm. um, I am satisfied that, yes, we, we may have slowed down, but I really believe it is a slowdown to be able to go a further distance. Yeah. And, and, and I, that's I agree with that. My position. I think it's a necessary two step back so that you could move uh, two or three steps forward down yes. the road. But take that pause, take that repositioning, let the dust settle as well. Yeah. I think too that the, the evolution in um, citizenship, the whole concept of citizenship, Nationality, mm -hmm. domicile, yes, domicile you know, well. tax residence, all of those things are going to continue to evolve. Correct. And so citizenship as we know it today, I don't believe it's going to be the same thing um, 10 years from now. That's interesting. I agree with and, that. And I so there is, there is still going to be um, a demand for the the these offerings I agreed. and but within an evolving yeah, evol environment uh, michael i 100 percent agree with you i've been doing this for 30 years there was only residency and then 2004 2005 uh, came the citizenship now we have these tax residency schemes and it's all evolving as a function of Mankind and wealthy and mankind in general being a lot more mobile, having the options of not one, not two, but sometimes three or four jurisdictions yes. in which they share their time. Um, not avoiding anything, just living life, living and running their businesses and running their affairs. It's the and concept of the global citizen. It, indeed. It's yeah. really, we're in that era, and uh, some countries are adapting to it faster than others, but uh, it's a, it is an evolution. Uh, and I uh, will tell you, the answer to that question is it'll be here forever. <laughs> so we can move on to the next one. But I, I like both your optimism um, because it, uh, it shows that indeed we are in a very interesting, interesting space. And I, a final comment on this, you know, just when I was starting my career, there was this massive wave all from Hong Kong looking to establish a residency um, in another country prior to the handover in 97. So there's this massive wave, what I call the smart capital in the late 80s. And then your mass affluence all bought into this. And they all went to Australia and US and Canada and UK. And, and, and we thought to ourselves, oh, then that's the massive wave. We'll never have anything like that. And then a thing called China woke up and the, superseded it tenfold. And uh, you would have told me two year, three years ago that you know one of my top three source countries would be Americans. I would have thought, what? Are you serious? Uh, but it is. And last I checked, there's more wealthy uh, families and, and millionaires in that nation than any other nation on, on the world. So for whatever reasons they have, and there are many, it's not just one, there's many reasons uh, why Americans are looking at the solutions. It tells me uh, we're gonna be busy for a while. Uh, so I'll just take a pause to remind our YouTube watchers who are watching to leave your questions um, in the comment sections. And for those of you listening on the podcast, don't forget to send us your questions at questions at globalpassportinvestor.com. So let's get a little bit competitive, gentlemen. What does St. Kitts and Nevis offer that you can't find in your Eastern Caribbean CBI neighbors? Uh, that's to be specific in Antigua, and Barbuda, Dominica, Grenada, and St. Lucia. What, what's what's St. Kitts' unique card, uh, and not just on the CBI front, but as you would describe uh, as a nation, maybe? Does anyone want to tackle yeah. that one? Well, I, I, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, as, as you know, um, our, our, our brothers and sisters across the sub-region islands, we all pretty much the same have to offer. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're all endowed by the Almighty, by some of the very same characteristics. Um, but specific to your, your question, I think where I can see St. Kitts and stands out is the, I think we have a government in place that is willing, they're determined to seek out the sustainable path to CBI. Mm. 
and more importantly are willing to take the hard decisions now knowing that it's going to put you're going to pull your belt tighter you're going to be without the kind of income you're accustomed to have everybody's going to suffer a little take that hard decision mm -hmm. towards ensuring that this program is on a sustainable footing yeah, to that. provide income and good living for all the residents and citizens into the future. Mm. That has to be a hard decision to take, Yes, to give up. I mean, we, we get the comments all the time. Uh, Sink is out of the CBI business, or oh, they're going to they're gonna die, they're not going to make the money, they're gonna, the budget is going to be seriously impacted. Yes, that's true, but it took strength willpower mm -hmm. and determination to make that decision mm -hmm. for the better good down the road. And yeah. I think that's what we have in St. Mm -hmm. by the fact that we're being so proactive about this. We're not waiting to see when the hammer is going to drop. No, we are taking action to ensure it doesn't mm -hmm. drop. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where St. Yeah, Kitts and Navy show its difference. I think the supranational bodies will take note over that, I think. I, uh, I, I think that our reputation in the industry is also a big plus for us. Mm -hmm. um, notwithstanding the changes that we have made to the program, what I have discovered in my travels is that there is still a general preference for our program, even at the present price levels. Um, or at least it's the first thing people inquire. I could tell you that. Yes. Because I'm in those markets. Yes. And I could tell you there's so much value and power to having been the first. Yes. Yep. And I tell you, as a nation, you benefit from that more than any others. Um, uh, you know, I remember we got involved with Antigua already 10 years ago, and we were starting to launch it in 2014 in the Middle East. They say, oh, citizenship. You mean St. Kitts? <laughs> well, it, it's a neighbor to it. They knew St. Kitts. Yeah. Yeah. They don't know Grenada at that time. They didn't know St. Lucia at that time, but they knew St. Kitts because you guys were there first and there was a lot of effort in bringing that to market. And uh, you still benefit from that brand is the point I think you're making. Yeah. Um, and, and that ties into the point you're making, Farron, in terms of, okay, it got frothy and very agitated and, and, and excited there, but... We're going to lead again. We're, it, we're going to reel it in. Yes. We're going to look at what's really going on here and uh, position the brand in, in yeah, the right it's, place. It's a question of, of, of protecting the brand. Yeah. If you are selling, um, if you are offering a product that is um, a premium product, um, the first and the finest and platinum product and all of that, then you have to attach a platinum price to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it you know, it only goes without saying. <laughs> Otherwise, um, prospective investors will begin to question the value of yeah. the offering. Yeah. Indeed. You know, is this really what it says it is? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that is a point that we are trying to um, bring home to our uh, brothers and sisters in, in the other jurisdictions, that what we are offering is valuable and Therefore, we cannot just give it away. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's, that's the point we make. No, I think that's a point well taken. Uh, and as you said, it's not without maybe a little uh, you know, a pain or belt tightening at the beginning. But, uh, but it also allows for some creative thinking around how, how to position that brand and, and the offering. I know there's some things being worked out. We'll leave that to maybe another podcast. Uh, gentlemen, we've come to the part of the show where I ask my, my guests to share uh, a unique story. We call it anecdota time. Imagine that we're having a ting with a sting or a cocktail of chores here at St. Kitts and Nevis and we're trading anecdotes. Except I want you to tell our listeners in our audience uh, anything that you find unique or intriguing uh, could be funny uh, or it could be uh, just yeah something intriguing and unique, whether it be it from the island or nation point of view, the program, CBI point of view, anything that comes to mind. I know you, you come from different angles. Uh, you, you obviously, uh, I'm sure, have interesting uh, applicants you would have uh, seen over the lifespan of your activity there. Farron, you too have dealt with a lot of clients. 
is there something that stands out that you want to share with our listeners? Fair? Uh, well, yeah, um, I see you have something at the top <laughs> of your head here. No, no, for me, um, I think I'll use that question to just maybe share something with our citizens, our economic citizens who may not know this. Um, you know, they become citizens and they say, they see a very tranquil, beautiful St. Kitts and Nevis. It might interest them to know that that relationship was not always that rosy. Oh, okay. um, there was actually a period when the, the, the people in Nevis were very unhappy with the way they were being governed and sought to secede from the island of St. Kitts to have I their see. own separate government and become an independent country. Yes. In fact, uh, I think it was back on 10th August 1998 when an actual referendum was held. Oh, no less. And okay. uh, I think it, would, it required a two-thirds majority for, for, for the secession to, to happen. Okay. I think at the time the, the, they got 62% of the votes. So it was squashed. Yes, it's interesting. The, the, the young generation of today, uh, the persons who felt hurt and wanted to secede, and the politicians are gone. And we have seen the young generation of the two islands come so much closer. Oh, that's good. That's Where encouraging. You, I don't think you could even raise that subject in today. Okay. It's, it's going to be... Would you agree with that, uh, Michael? Do you think it's, it's a less <laughs> urban issue than, than it was maybe a few decades ago? Well, there, you, you don't really hear a whole lot about that anymore. Anymore. Yeah. Um, a lot has changed over um, between then and now. Hmm. For instance, we now have a case where almost every weekend, Kittisians go to Nevis. And vice versa? No. Well, not or so much vice versa, okay. but we but, okay. go to Nevis to enjoy and yeah. just to enjoy Nevis. There you go. You know, it's... And so that... You, know, you, you want to go on a, generation you want to go on a staycation? Yeah. First thing that comes to mind, go to Nevis. Nevis. Yeah. You know, and I can relate. Yeah, so you don't really hear too much about that anymore. Yeah. But I, I thought can. that would be interesting only yeah. because you, you become a citizen and, and you would think, well, no, that doesn't make sense. That's a, that, that would be like news to most people. Yes. Yeah. It, it would, and it was for me the first time I heard of it. I hadn't realized they, they went as far as actually having a referendum. I knew there was this historical tension yes. and these historical yes, it's ideas it's of secession. I knew I heard about that, but I never thought it made its way to an actual referendum, um, which is interesting. I, I'm from the French part of Canada in Quebec. We went through two sets <laughs> yes, <of> yes. referendums <laughs> in my lifetime. Uh, so I could appreciate the significance of that. But in the same way, the issue has abated as the generations have moved on and the uh, that movement in, in, in the province of Quebec uh, barely exists yeah, right. today. Right. Um, and, and that's a good thing in so far as people uh, you know, cross pollinate and they understand each yes. other more and they and in your case yeah, that and, you know, thinking changes, yes, changes. and yeah. over the years, as I said before, people will have a different view about migration yes. and citizenship and nationality and the domicile, hmm. you know, all of those things are, are going to change oh, kind of, over They're time. kind of morphing, yeah, there's, yeah. yes. And yeah. as more and more people become yeah. internationalized, uh, I call them, uh, you know, these, uh, uh, yeah, they're basically global citizens, yeah. uh, but uh, uh, they, 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 they become less affected by these old issues. You know, there's always the anecdote. In the old days, you can't play Manchester football unless you're from Manchester. You could play <laughs> Montreal Canadiens unless you're yeah. Montreal Canadiens. Until somebody said, you know what, those Russians are pretty good too, you know? Yeah. And, and, and exactly. so, so, so nations too have to open their minds yeah. and borders to bringing in talent and embracing the world. Yeah. And because programs like this do a great job. Even, of even here, you know, as, as Farron said, it's becoming a melting pot. Yes. Yeah. 25 Correct. years from now, this place is going to be completely yes. different. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Well, gentlemen, you've made me uh, feel at home here talking about all of this. It's uh, been really uh, nice to have you both, and thank you for your uh, for your uh, your comments. I don't know if there's anything you'd, either of you would like to add. Otherwise, we'll yeah. call it to now, and we'll we'll convene uh, over a ting and a sling, as I said earlier, maybe <laughs> by the beach here. Thank you for being such great guests. Um, and for our listeners and our viewers, uh, please stay tuned for the next episode of the Global Passport Investor. I'll see you all again shortly. Thank you.
Thank you, Harry. For a deep dive into the recommended residency and citizenship programs available, please check out latitudeworld.com for further details. <laughs>